So, the big question that we always start with is, why do we use robots? All right. And the reason that we use robots is basically for what I call, what I, mean, what I was taught was the 3Ds. All right. If it's dull, dirty, or dangerous, a robot is a perfect opportunity to be used. All right. Now, you may be thinking, dull, dirty, okay, what, what do you, you know, why don't we just always use robots, right? So, robots actually are not perfect, right? They do not fit the need of every job out there in the whole wide world, all right? Do they fit the need of a lot of jobs? Yes, all right? But they're not always perfect, all right? Um, and if it's a, if you're doing something that requires a lot of hand-eye coordination, uh, you know, like if you're holding on to this mega block and you're trying to put another mega block onto it, you know, having to actually figure out where vertically it is and everything else and get the rope other block twisted right so it doesn't, you know, interfere and things like that. Uh, it's not always going to be a good job for a robot to do. Now, if you have two robots doing this, you know exactly how piece A is being held and exactly how piece B is being held, then it's very easy for the robot to do it. So it really depends on the situation at hand. Um, but anything that actually requires you to be able to, like, look and inspect and make things sure things are lined up or something along those lines... Robots are not going to be the perfect end-all solution. All right. So that leads us to the three Ds of robotics, which is dull, dirty, and dangerous. So, um, yeah. So if a job is dull, boring, right? You don't want to do it. You don't want to be sit there all day and just basically put nuts on bolts. That sounds like a horrible job to me, at least. All right. What we'd rather do is say, okay, let's program the robot to do this. So all, robot, all you have to do is, there's going to be a bolt here. Whenever I tell you to go, you're going to put a nut and you're going to twist it on there. And then, you know, move away. And the next time I press go, you're going to put another nut and twist it on. And just repeat that process over and over and over and over and over again. So anytime that a robot's just doing something so repetitive that it gets boring for the human operator, that is a great use. All right, because as humans, once we get bored, that's when we start making mistakes, all right? When you're all excited and, you know, okay, maybe you got the, the new job excitement and jitters, maybe you're going to make some mistakes. But once you kind of understand the role and how everything's working and those types of things, you're, you're not going to be making as many mistakes. There still will probably be some, but you're not going to make as many. Um, but once you kind of get, like, you know, lulled into comfort here, that's when the mistakes start occurring, all right? And that's when it's dangerous. Kind of like uh, Tesla's, Tesla's self-driving cars. When you first start driving one and you're like, I don't really trust automation to drive me, you're hyper focused on everything around you to make sure that no, you know, you're not gonna crash into anything or something along those lines. However, after you know, your car have driven you many miles and you're going, this thing works perfectly, I'm gonna fall asleep at the wheel, that's when it starts becoming very, very dangerous for you because when the robot does make a mistake, your life is on the line. So we do need to be kind of careful. So when a job is very boring which driving long distance is all right um dirty and dangerous i kind of think go hand in hand all right um you know extremely dirty environments hydraulics um muddy pits you know things like that same with dangerous if you're going to be in an explosion environment or a nuclear facility you know where there's some radioactive whatever going on um all of those times dirty dangerous those both kind of kind of stick together um and it just a great place to be using robots instead of putting humans at risk. Let's move on. So there are five major subsystems for robots. We have the, starting at the right, we have the end effector, right? We have the robot manipulator itself. We have the controller, the power supply, and some way of programming it, all right? So, the controller. There are three main levels of hierarchy, all right? Um, starting all the way at the bottom is actuator control. So, this is actually what makes the robot itself, all right? As we move up one level, we have path control. So, this is how are we going to get from point A to point B? Um, and good robots, um, when you say move from point A to point B, all of their joints move at the exact same point or at the exact same time and they all finish moving at the exact same time so it's not like joint one is going to get to the final location and be finished before joint two gets there all right because that could cause all sorts of funny havoc and you know all sorts of other problems 
And then level three is your main control. And this is going to interpret what you type, interpret the inner information, and it's going to pass that information down to level two. All right. So the controller is the heart and brains of the whole robotic system. All right. And that takes us down to the manipulator. And this is going to consist of different segments. All right. Um, and this is what allows the robot to actually do the real work in the long run. Now, this does is required to be um, kind of jointly operated with the end effector, which is also doing the work. That's doing the final actual control, but the, the robot itself is doing the main um, work of the entire system. Um, as you can see here, there are two different types of joints. We have rotary joints and we have linear joints. All right. Now, on kind of what you would, you would picture as your standard robot, which is what I have kind of pictured in the top right corner, that would be all rotary joints. So this, you know, they all have pivot points, all right, which may be a good thing. It may not be a bad thing. If we want to look at like a 3D printer, on the other hand, which uh, is a robot in itself, that has X, Y, and Z joints, and those all move linearly. They move in a straight line, all right? Now, if you go to like a you know, De uh, Delta style 3D printer, it's really still just linear joints. But anyway, so linear or rotary, all right? And the manipulator has multiple ways that we can identify it. We can identify it by the method of control, by the power source, which we're going to talk about in a few slides, um, the actuators of the joints, so linear versus rotary, um, other factors that could be the degrees of freedom or how many different joints the robot has. So the type of robot is going to be extremely, extremely important in the long run. All right. The end effector, and there are all sorts of different end effectors on here. All right, um, this is the manipulator end of manipulator tooling. So if the robot's the manipulator, this is the tooling that actually does the work. All right, um, and here I have a few options. So we have what I'm going to call it looks basically like a 3D printer, maybe a welding tip up at the top. We have some custom made one that has you know very specific grab here points for whatever it's supposed to be holding. We have kind of a standard old boring uh, just gripper on the end right here. And then this one in the middle, this one's kind of, this is my favorite one right here. I always want to build one of these because I think it's awesome. All right. This type can actually grab on to basically any surface. All right. What do you think is inside that, that blue section right here? And it's something that many of you will have in your homes. Any guesses? Like stress ball material, kind of? No, the outside does kind of look like a stress ball, but that that's that's a much harder foam. All right, so that wouldn't work very well. I'll give you a hint. This this works by pulling a vacuum here. So whatever the material is there has to be able to kind of collapse. Latex? Mm, latex would be the outside. So that would be basically of just the balloon. You possibly have it for breakfast. Cereal? No, we're getting closer. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. All right. So the answer would be coffee grounds. Coffee. At least that's what somebody who made one of these at home had put inside of it, which I was like, that is really freaking neat. Um, but basically, the, the end effector here gets pushed onto something. So in this case, this glass, and then they pull the vacuum out, which causes all those coffee grounds to kind of contract, which applies pressure to things. So you can pick up like an egg with this thing without cracking it, which I find to be really neat. So I really want to build one of those for our ADBs, but I just I haven't had time, you know, whatever. So if any of you guys want to look into how to build one of these, and it's I think it's like a universal um, you know, gripper or something like that, that would be absolutely awesome. But anyway, um, some of the types. We've got suction, so if we're using um, uh, 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 not compressed air. Well, you can use compressed air with a venturi, but um, just a, you know, a suction, claw, vices. We can have welders, all right, extruders, lasers, or other custom ones. All right. So an end effector doesn't actually have to be something that physically grabs something and moves it. It could be there to add material. All right. So um, spot welders are huge on the uh, car assembly lines. 
So they have robots that basically have spot welders on the outside of them, and they you know move around along the car chassis as it's sitting there and put a whole bunch of spot welds in constantly all over that car chassis. So that is a great option or a great thing that we could do. Um, or you could actually have a robot with just a normal welder on it and physically follow a path. Um, and the ABB software that we will use, um, it actually has that option that you can import a CAD model and then you can say, you know, basically make a path around it. Um, and it's just really kind of neat when you do that. And it's like, oh, write the code for me. Just, you know, follow this. And it's like, bam, done. So really kind of quite impressive in the long run. Next, we have the power supply. All right. And there are really three different types here. Uh, and I guess electrical gets broken down the two. So we have AC and we have DC. So obviously AC electric, DC electric. Those are going to be your most common types. All right. Um, they're simple-ish. I mean, you know, basically there's power form everywhere. You don't need really any special equipment to get a, an electrical powered robot running. Um, even if you only have 120 volts in your house, you can still get 240 volts out by plugging them into um, a transformer to pop the voltage up, which is actually what we did in the classroom is we don't have 240 volts in there. Um, in our new classroom next semester, next year, uh, we will have that voltage, so we hopefully can ignore those transformers, which would be really nice. Um, pneumatic is another option. Now, obviously, that does have a specialty, um, yeah, a special power source. So you need some sort of compressor to be dealing with that. Um, and then hydraulic would be another one, which, again, special type of pump that's going to be moving that hydraulic fluid around. Now, there are definitely benefits to doing pneumatic or hydraulic. Um, pneumatic is a very clean option that is non-explosive. Um, hydraulic is a dirty option, but it's not explosive, at least at normal operating conditions. And in theory, you are pushing a liquid around normally an oil, so that could catch on fire, but um, still. Um, but hydraulic is the most powerful of all of these. So if you need a robot to lift a whole hell of a lot of weight, then hydraulic is your best option. All right, if you need a robot that moves extremely fast, pneumatic probably one of your better options. Um, but electrical is going to be the most easy to build, design, control, and be precise with, which is a, really probably the biggest, biggest benefit of that. And that takes us to the means of programming. So here we have an old school teach pendant. All right. Now, because I say old school, do you think that means the teach pendants have gone away? Now. Teach pendants have not gone away. They are still alive and well today. All right. So this is still something that is being used. Can't drink that more. Um, so um, our, 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 both of our ABB robots, or three, all three of them, do have teach pendants with them, and you will always be using them. All right. Or there's a good possibility you'll be using them. They are how you manipulate the robot without having to have a computer attached to it. All right, or at least the proper way, I'll say, to manipulate a robot. Um, most robots do have like an emergency release button that basically makes the, the robot go limp, um, which on our small little ABB, uh, our IRB-120s, I think they have a 5 kilogram payload limit. Um, you know, pressing that button, having a robot go limp, and you holding it up isn't really a big issue. But if you get to larger robots and you press that button and you make all your joints go limp, man, I think it'd come crashing to this floor and do a whole lot of damage to whatever is around it. So not something you really want to use. You really want to use your teach pendant to solve those types of problems. All right. Um, the programming. How we traditionally do this is we teach it a bunch of points. All right. Um, so you would say, hey, you know, I want you to move from point A to point B to point C to point D in a very logical progression. All right. Now, how robots work, unlike PLCs, since I think all of you now had my PLC class, um, is PLCs, as you remember, it runs through all of the code at once, it hits the end, updates its outputs, reads its inputs, runs through all of the code, updates its outputs, reads its inputs, rinse and repeat. All right. Robots, on the other hand, are very sequential. So we do step one. And until step one is done, we don't move to step two. Once step two is done, we move to step three. Once step three is done, we move to step four. And there are some ways to, to get around that. Um, if you think of PLCs, every one basically is an if statement. If these things are true, turn the output on. If any of those are not true, turn the output off. All right. 
Um, and with the, the, the robotics, we do have the possibility to do if statements. So if you have one robot feeding two different conveyor belts, you could say, if conveyor belt one is empty, load a piece there. If conveyor belt two is empty, load a piece there. If neither conveyor belt is empty, don't do anything. Just sit here and wait. All right. So that is a complete and utter possibility that we could and probably will end up with. All right. Um, can you do 100% of the training with a teach pendant? Yes. All right. You do not need to touch a computer at all when you're dealing with robots. Um, does the computer make it faster? In my opinion, yes. All right. Um, does the computer add some more levels of complexity to it? Oh, you better believe it. All right. Um, when we get to ABB world, um, which I said we might be starting right off with this semester. Um, if you think about it, normally with the do bots as well, but normally you have, a, if you're trying to find a position in space, right, we have X, Y, and we have Z. Because the ABBs are six degrees of freedom, which we'll come back to in a minute, um, if, let's, let me try to quick draw this out, right? So if I'm trying to come over this far, you know, that's my final resting point. And your robot, you know, we have this. It's very easy to go, this this joint has to be this angle and this joint has to be that angle and that will get us to that point in space and that's how the do bots work but once you start adding more degrees of freedom and you have another bend and another bend and another bend all of a sudden you now can grab it from that way you can grab it from this way or that way or you know whatever direction that you want so we now have xyz and i believe we have like q1 through four um and that tells the robot which which from which angle you want to be picking that piece up. And there is some formula to, that you can use to then calculate all of this stuff. I don't remember what it is off the top of my head, and I've never learned it uh, to, you know very well. Um, so whenever I'm dealing with the robots, I always do all of my positioning um, with the teach pendant when at all possible. All right. Now that won't always work out, but when possible, I like to use the teach pendant. Um, and for most things that's probably the easiest way to do it um and then go back to the computer and just write your code so use a teach pendant to find all your locations and to save them all even if you give them crappy names originally and then rename them once you're back on the computer it'll be a much easier option for you um, now in an ideal world in that simulated robot in that simulated abb robot software um you would be able you would have your entire facility or at least the little section where that robot is in CAD. So that way you could put your robot in the actual environment and you could actually see how everything is working, which would be really quite nice to do. But you, you know, many companies won't have that or whatever the case. So not really the end of the world, just something that you're going to get used to doing. And this takes us back to degrees of freedom. All right. Now, if you want your robot to be completely versatile, you need at least six degrees of freedom. All right. That is a minimum. All right. The human hand has 27 bones with 22 degrees of freedom to it, which I find to be absolutely nuts. But when you think about all the different ways and how you can move your fingers and all those other fun things, that is a lot of you know, capability. Um, so if most robots, you're only going to need three or five, three to five to get their job done. All right. Now, the more you have, the more complex the controller is going to be, which means the more crazy your programming might have to be, um, which is one of the reasons why people just buy pre-built industrial robots. They don't feel like dealing with all the complicated controller design and, you know, all those other fun things. They go, we'll just buy a robot. We'll put our own end effector on it. And as long as that robot we bought has the capability to reach everywhere we need and everything else, we'll be in good shape. All right. It's not really a big issue. But that might not always be the case in the long run. Um, so sometimes you are going to build some custom robots. And even if you're using a PLC to control something, you still may qualify it as a robot in the long run. So it really depends on what you are doing with it and your definition of a robot. Um, so here we have, you can see X is our first degree of freedom. Y is our second, or sorry, Z is our second. Y is our third. And then if you would see, we'd have up and down. 
rotating around, basically rotating around those three different axes. Those would be our last three degrees of freedom. If we would look at our ABBs, we have our base, which rotates, so that would be one. Then we come up here to a shoulder joint, that would be two. Then we come out, this is three. Then we come out again, that's four. Um, we have a rotation. We have two different rotations. I think there's a rotation there and there. So I think this would be four, five, six. But anyway, there are six different degrees of freedom on that robot, which I always find to be kind of crazy. Useful, but really overall kind of crazy. Um, and again, this is why we just like to stick with our programming. All right. All right. Um, are we doing all questions? Anybody? I'll take that as a no. So types of control systems. Um, this is where it becomes rather important. We have servo-based and non-servo-based. So these servo-based ones are going to be have feedback. And that is the main difference between them, is feedback. All right. So in a servo-based system, I have these pictures backwards overall. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, in a servo-based system, you would tell it move from point X to point Y, and it would be tracking itself, and it would know exactly where it is along that line the entire time. And if something happens, it would know that, and it would know to continue until it got to Y. All right. Um, you know, think of it like a, a riding your bike. All right. If I told you to go from X to Y, and you said, okay, it's going to take me 30 pedals to get there, well... If you have an extra load on you and you've shifted down, well, now the number of pedals it takes to go from point A to point B is different, and you don't know that. Where if we're using our human eyes, our eyes are giving our body feedback to know, hey, we're not at the destination yet. We shouldn't stop moving. All right. So servo, closed loop. There is feedback always going back to say, hey, we're here or we're not here yet. All right. I guess this top one is showing you that where the controller is sending a signal to open the airline that's extending the um, air cylinder here until the limit switch gets pressed. And then that sends a signal back to the controller saying, hey, we've extended all the way. Stop send, you know, stop trying to extend. Non-servo, on the other hand, is much, much simpler. All right. Um, so if we just got rid of this limit switch on this one up top here and that whole yellow line, this would be a non-servo, so there is no feedback, all right? So basically, the controller would say, hey, extend the cylinder, and it might say, okay, I'm going to do that for two seconds or whatever before I move on to the next step. And again, if, if we're maybe if we have our air cylinder moving straight up and down instead of side to side, and we have a 10-pound weight on it compared to having no weight, 10 pounds might need five seconds to get all the way up, where no weight might only need half a second. Um, so in that case, the controller is moving on before it's actually reached its definite its destination. All right. If we go back to uh, 3D printers, um, traditional 3D printers are non-servo based um, robots. So the microcontroller tells it, "Hey, move that servo, not servo, move that stepper motor." 513 steps, and that will get us to our next location. And it goes click, 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 click. Well. If you put too much weight on a servo or a stepper motor, it will sometimes skip steps. So it'll try to move, but it won't actually be able to rotate. So it all of a sudden now is one step short and then another step short. And that's how, if you've ever seen a 3D print that has failed miserably, or if it's printed the base fine and the top half is printed off set for some odd reason, that's because the 3D print failed and it lost, it lost steps. So it thought it was in location A, but really it was in location B, right? So these non-servo often referred to as limited sequence, pick and place, fix stop. All right. So again, it's just like, I'm going to extend. All right. Now let's do something else. All right. Let's do something else. And there is no location of where it is. When it comes to electric drives, we do have AC servos and we do have DC servos. All right. Um, we also have um, stepper motors, which is what I was just talking about. So servo motors, they're going to, as we just talked about, have some sort of feedback so it, the robot knows exactly where it was, or where it is, and where it should be, and it's trying to constantly fix that. 
Snapper motors. Cool. How they work is we have our rotor here, and we have pairs of magnets going around it. Really should have a little slide on how servos or how stepper motors work at this point. All right, box that up. I will say we have this magnet here. What a stepper does is it turns this magnet on and this one on. So one's positive, one negative, which then causes it to rotate this direction and then turns this one on and that one off. So it goes like, you know, step one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, it repeats. This circles around and around and around and around. Um, and that allows us to know and be very precise control over how many steps it takes to rotate that object. And servos are rated in a specific number of steps in the long run. Now, if I go ahead and grab this, because even though I am at home, oops, my headphones plugged in, I can't move too far. As even though I am at home, I still have nice examples. So this is actually a rather beefy stepper motor. Um, it is 5 amps, and I believe each step is 1.8 degrees, is what the label says. So, 1.8 times 2 would be um, 3.6 times 100 would get us 360. So, you need to send 200 pulses to this to get it to rotate a one full revolution or 360 degrees all right um, and then we can take that we can do what's called micro stepping and things like that where you can then actually do a whole lot more steps before you um, actually get to one full rotation so it allows us to get very precise control over things and um, this does this one because of its size does have some pretty good uh, power behind it but you can go down to smaller ones with um, you know not as much torque and then you put a little gearbox on it, and you can go from not having a lot of torque, but having a lot of torque, but having very little revolutions. So maybe you have to, um, you know, send, I don't know, uh, say, a thousand steps or whatever before you get to one full rotation because of gearboxes. And we control um, stepper motors with a little step driver like this. What that's for. Let me go ahead and unwrap this. We got a focus camera. Fun. Move you out some. There we go. So we have a little step driver, stepper motor driver here, and you can see we've got our signals and other side signals and settings and a voltage and things like that. Um, and this allows us to do up to i guess twenty five thousand pulses per revolution so there's a whole lot more steps going on there um, than the 200 on this because of all the crazy little micro steppings that you can do now there are some disadvantages to micro stepping and i overall would not actually suggest micro stepping a lot but there is that possibility there if you want to or if there was a need for it so um so Stepper motors, we have electric actuators, which are basically pneumatic cylinders, um, except for we're going to use a traditional motor to drive it. I really need to get some more pictures on these things. Um, most of them look something like this. You've got a big cylinder, a little like tumor sitting on the bottom here, and you have your motor in here with a gear that goes to another gear that's spinning a, a little threaded rod inside, and then there's a basic another something on the outside that's when that threaded rod spins, it physically pushes this thing out. So it acts just like a um, little pneumatic cylinder, but it's all electrically driven. Um, and again, you can get those that have some pretty high power, which is definitely nice. Um, some of the issues with these electric these electric actuators um, or using conventional gears off a of motor is backlash. Um, so again, especially if you're doing a, a non-servo-based system, but backlash is, let me quick draw up a really ugly gear here. I need to draw up another really ugly gear. All right. Doot, 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 doot. So what backlash is, is see all the space in here between this tooth and that tooth? All right. Backlash allows, no, oh, not allows, causes that. So when, even though the motor is spinning, it hasn't actually moved our output yet because this tooth hasn't come in contact with that. So you can actually rotate 
those gears a little bit back and forth without actually moving any or while well, moving the output even though the motor isn't spinning um, this is a big big issue that we have to actually take into account and there are some specialty gears and things like that that will allow you to get rid of backlash um, using some, some crazy techniques um, but there are options that are to help reduce backlash and take get rid of it for non-servo based things for servo-based stuff, it's not really a big issue because your motor spins and you don't care about that. What you're doing is then you're monitoring the output shaft, maybe an encoder or something like that. So you are keeping exact location of the output shaft and you don't care about anything about the motor itself. So motor could be spinning or not spinning and you'd still know exactly where that output shaft is. Um, so torque versus speed is another big one. A lot of times you'll see... Um, motors especially you'll see oh yeah it's rated at like 3000 rpm but only you know one foot bound of torque and you're like that thing's gonna cruise like I, you know i can't do anything with that it's gonna move too fast well that's where the gear trains come in with gears we can then speed that thing way down and then crank the torque up all right um so it, there's always a ratio between torque and speed on something so you only you know you have a one horsepower motor it only ever is going to be one horsepower but we can use gear ratios to change the torque. We can increase the torque and decrease the speed or increase the speed and decrease the torque if that's the type of thing that you need. So lots and lots of options going on there. Now, when it comes to hydraulic systems, all right, so here you can see our nice hydraulic actuator here. Um, again, this is meant for moving lots of heavy weight, all right? Um, and in the long run, between hydraulics and pneumatics, there's not a whole lot of a difference, all right? Um, hydraulics are much higher in power than their pneumatic counterpart. All right. Um, so they, they're meant to handle like abuse. They do a lot of lifting. All right. Um, they are very simple in the long terms. You put fluid in one side, the extender, the cylinder extends, you put fluid in the other, the cylinder retracts. That's all it is. All right. Uh, however, they are going to be on the expensive side. You do need to have a you need to have a pump you need to have return lines you need to have transmit lines you need to have solenoid valves especially if you're going to do variable speed solenoid valves the list just kind of goes on and on and on so they are going to be on the expensive side all right they do overall take a, a, a beating though again they are built to last i kind of feel like this is like the diesel engine of the car world where you know diesel engines hundred thousand or you know hundred or one million miles you know is like nothing on an 18 wheeler you put a little four cylinder or four stroke gas engine in there that thing would be dead in no time compared comparatively speaking all right um they're not going to be efficient because of all uh, having to have a pump which or an electric motor spin a pump which pushes fluids through lines which have resistance you know yada 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 so it's not an efficient use of power but you can get a lot of power out of it and they are not really certified for clean rooms because what happens when you have a link Leak. All of a sudden, you now have oil all over your perfectly clean environment. So that is a downside. Now, pneumatic cylinders, on the other hand, are going to be cheaper than um, hydraulics, comparatively. They also move at much, much, much higher speeds. All right. Um, pneumatics, we're talking, you know, maybe 200 PSI, probably more traditionally like 130, 150-ish. Um, hydraulics on the other hand we're talking about thousand psi maybe or even higher depending on your system um, however the pumps aren't put out putting that much flow in a hydraulic system so we have high pressure low flow um, in pneumatics we have overall low pressure but much higher flow capabilities so we're talking about you know many cubic feet per minute in the the hydra in the pneumatic world compared to hydraulics um, so that pneumatics are much higher speed now, just because a higher speed doesn't mean they can't have high power, all right? Um, if we have a little cylinder here, right? And let's say the volume of this completely extended is five cubic inches, all right? Well, if we have a different cylinder here, and that's with a diameter of one, just to make my life easy, um, same height, different width, right? But this one's going to be five or five inches wide. Um, which probably means it's closer to like 40 cubic inches, 45. I don't know. I'm not, not actually doing the math there. Um, this one, if this one fills in one second, you know, this one's going to fill, take seven seconds to fill. But, or eight seconds or nine or whatever the, you know, whatever you want to call it. But because it has 
it's a radius of five instead of one. Where's my calculator? There we go. So surface area of this pneumatic cylinder here is a pi r squared. So r would be 0 0.5 squared times 3.14. So we get uh, 0 0.785 cubic inches. Well, 2.5 squared times uh, 3.14, we get 19. So we get about 20 times more power over here than we do over there. So if this one could lift one pound, this one could lift 20 pounds. All right. Now, if we're running 100 PSI through this, this little one could lift, uh, what was the math saying? 0.785, so 78 pounds. This one could lift 19, 1900 pounds. So huge, huge, huge difference there in the long run. So going to a bigger cylinder makes a big difference. And this is both pneumatic and hydraulic. Um, so we can still lift a lot of heavy loads with pneumatics, but they're just not really designed for that. And, and you have to make sure your seals and everything else are meant to handle those types of loads. Um, so traditionally, small to medium loads. Um, and we do have um, speed control to some extent. You can put little flow regulators in, so that way you don't put a full, you know, you know, a one inch line right into this thing. You can say, okay, let's, let's treat it like it's an eighth inch line or whatever, and it'll be much slower. So, um, because air is compressible, pneumatics, right? Reason compressed air. Um, it is compressible, which means we can store it in just a normal little tank, which is absolutely wonderful. But because of that, um, that also means that when we're putting it in here and these, it can compress. So again, if I put a hundred pound load on both of these, right, uh, or a 70 pound load, this one is going to compress a lot more than that one because of the surface area and everything else. Um, but that means, you know, again, if I say, oh, put one second of air into this, it might fill it to here, you know, like fill it to there normally. But once I uh, put a load on it, it might only fill to here for that one second because of the actual compression of the air. So that is both a, a bounce downside and a positive because we can store it. Um, but because of that compression, these are not as accurate. So a little give and take going on there. Now, the work envelopes is going to be a big, important fact here. And the work envelope is, as this last bullet says, an area that a point on a robot wrist is capable of reaching. All right. Um, so what can this actual do and what's affecting it? So the arrangement of joints, length, joints and length affect the work envelope. So, um, yeah, you might not be, it doesn't mean you always can reach every single point in the world. All right. Um, and that point is a great robot can reach. Um, and there are going to be a large variety of these. So if we look at the first one, which is a revolute configuration, which is what our ABBs are. So here you can see they have um, the five different axes. So we have axis one, axis two, axis three, axis four, axis five. And actually, this right here would be axis six. Now they're probably not including that because it's not affecting the work envelope in this case, but this is still probably a six axis robot. And if we were to look at this work envelope from the side, this is what you'd see. And if you looked at it from the top, that's what you would see. So if we combine those two, you get this kind of 360, you know, view. So we can't quite reach behind it, but we can, you know, can't reach base itself. Um, and that's because of um, this offset and length here. If we made this longer, that would then probably be able to reach and hit itself, which may or may not be a good thing. So really kind of really truly depends on what's going on. So the work envelope really affects uh, the, what you're trying to do and what you're trying to reach and all those other fun things. So um, this will affect how you design your um, your area around the robot for where it can and can't reach. Um, on our, in the classroom, we have our tables, which actually have this little fold down front flap in the front. And instead of having the robots be mounted sideways or perfectly straight facing out, I determined, decided to mount them at like this crazy ass angle. All right. We didn't want them pointing straight out because wires stuck out the back and that made them too wide to fit through doors, which was a big no, no for us. Um, so we didn't want to do that. 
we didn't want to put them directly sideways because then they wouldn't be able to reach this half, you know, this area on the table. So that to me was a big no-no. So by putting them at this angle, we were able to save a lot of desk space. Um, we were able to still reach the entire table, um, including all the way out basically to the edge or pretty darn close. Um, but that does make our control a little bit hard because when you like when you use the, the teach pen and you say, hey, robot, move to the right, instead of saying you move this way, we're actually telling it to move. Oh, that's even bad. Telling it to move that way. So you really have to like situate yourself in front of the robot, not facing the table. You kind of think about yourself sitting in front of the robot, which makes it a bit interesting to say the least. Um, the Revolute is the closest resembling to the human body. So um, yeah, it, it can, yeah. All right. Anyway, moving on. SCARA, which is the Selective Compliance Assembly Robot Arms. All right. So this one is only a four axis or four uh, degree of freedom. So you can see we have uh, a rotation, rotary joint one, rotary joint two, rotary joint four is up and down. And they're saying there's a three here. I'm not quite sure what that three is uh, pointing to in this case. Uh, again, this end probably does rotate, so the whole end effector can spin around in circles. So um, this is going to be extremely rigid in a vertical motion, uh, not quite so much in the left and right, forward and back, but up and down, very, very tight. Um, this is, is, is a very short vertical axis compared to the uh, 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 Revolute that we just looked at. Um, and, you know, oops, go back. Um, that is affected by, you know, there's, again, this piece of metal, you know, there's a bar in here that goes up and down, and it's affected by how tall this is. So if you want to have more vertical, then this has to be taller. You know, this box has to be something like that. Um, so not really ideal in any any case there. Um, but it was designed for a very specific purpose. It's not going to be as complicated of a controller in the long run, so that's nice for programming purposes. Um, and it may not be as accurate in certain areas of the work envelope. So that's what this blue box up here is showing. It's saying anywhere in here, we are extremely accurate. Anywhere outside of that, not so much. All right. So again, a little bit of a give and take going on in that, that type of world. Um, but again, if you're trying to do some assembly work straight up and down, this is the best type of robot for that because it's the simplest. And it, you know, has that, it has a perfect linear actuator moving straight up and down. If this one is trying to be used for assembly, it actually has to change two of those joints at once to move them closer together, right? Um, you know, it can't just say, oh, let me just move this one down because then it's moving in an arc, all right? Um, I do this, right? If I just move this top one, you know, it's going to move kind of down like this to that point. And if you want something to be like pressed together, like, like mega blocks here, Yet you don't want to come down in the scooping arc pattern because you're not gonna it's gonna hit, it's gonna bind, and it's gonna yell at you. So you actually have to move two joints or more at once to move in a perfectly straight line, which you will see later this semester. Uh Cartesian, again, another decent one for assembly work. Alright, this is X, Y, and Z. Alright. Um here you can see uh an enclosed work envelope where this one is not enclosed. Alright. Um so this would be, as I said, basically your your typical 3D printer right here, um, where this might be more of a standard. So you can see we have our x-axis there, our y-axis there, and our or another axis here. So Z, X, Y, Y, Z, whatever you want to, whatever order you want to call them in. All right. And this Cartesian comes. Um, this is really simple because it's just X, Y, Z. There's no math involved. Um, one of the assignments I like to make you guys do is to do the math to figure out for the do bots. Um, what angles do you have to make things so you can figure out how to get it to go to a specific X, Y, Z format. And it's actually a, kind of a complicated process. It's not, nothing more than like trigonometry using um, sine, cosine, tangent, arc, sine, you know, uh, law of sines, law of cosines, you know, things like that. Nothing too crazy, but it just takes a lot of thinking of like, okay, this angle means this and this is that, and I have to calculate this. And I've done it, and um, I've, had some, I've had a few students successfully do it in the long run. Many of them don't, can't quite wrap their mind around it. Um, the Cartesian leads to uh, also more of the cylindrical configuration. So you can still see we have our vertical is the same. 
our one axis is the same, but now instead of our another axis moving this way, we have rotation at the bottom. All right, so this gives us a cylindrical uh, area instead of our Cartesian x, y, z. Um, so we can still give it x, y, z coordinates, but again, you have to calculate the angle that you want to be able to figure that one out. And then we also have another spherical. So this is cylindrical. Here is a spherical. This is like a tank. All right. You can look left and right. You can look up, down, then you can extend in and out. All right. If you kind of look up here at this work envelope, it's kind of really funky. From the top, it's this beautiful, like, you know, half circle or whatever as far. Um, but then when you start going up and down with it, now, you, you know, you're only going from here to maybe there. And then, you know, so really kind of like something like that um, in a circular path. So kind of a funky thing. Um, it does have good weightlifting capabilities, though. So that is something to take into consideration. And last, we have special configurations. Um, so this is either a combination of some of the previous ones or just some really customized something or other. Um, oftentimes, these robots, especially the Revolut, um, these are multi-purpose or general purpose. All right, again, you go to Alan Brad, not Alan Bradley, ABB or um, Universal or brand out there. I don't remember. But you go to one of these major companies and say, hey, I need a robot with this lifting capabilities and this type of reach. And they go, okay, this is the general robot you want to buy. And they just sell you the robot and you're done. All right. Um, again, you could build these things completely from scratch. Um, but most of the time it's like, okay, I need a general purpose robot. And the best part of the general purpose robot is the reprogrammable. So if for three years you're building, you know, part A, you know, you're, you're trying to make this little pulley right here. All right, great. You're all well and good. Uh, and then after three years, you're like, well, that pulley is now outdated and doesn't work anymore because no one uses a shaft of 0.63 inches. Well, now you say, okay, now we got to retool everything and you can still use your robots for a whole new purpose just by changing the end effector. So big, big, big win there. All right. So... What questions do you guys have for me? Or did I put you all to sleep already? Uh, I have a quick question. Okay. So what what do the pro what do you use to program them with like C or is there just different? So different... yeah, each manufacturer is going to have their own variation of it. Um, you know, which is kind of annoying. I think a lot of them are based kind of off of C. I don't think I can open Robot Studio on my computer and show you because I don't have a license at home anymore. Let's let's see if I can. What the? I need to find all these before I use this. Oh no, that sucks. Yeah, why why didn't you take me to this location? Took me to my downloads folder. Oh. No. Oh, that blows. Well, I had like some crazy stuff going on last year where you could um, like actually pick blocks up with, and it was the biggest pain in the butt in the whole freaking world. But let me go back to our main display. So here we have our robot. Expendent. You know, I still probably have time on this license. Um, so if I go to like program editor, so maybe I can't add code because my license is gone. Um, uh, okay, let's try going to rapid. So in this case, it's raw target, and this is what you would give it to say, oh, no, it's to move. So it'd be uh, like, in this case, it's move, and you have all these moves, and we'd say move joint. And then you give it the location and the velocity, the um, zoom and the frequency of the work object, yada, yada, yada. Um, but so you the program itself gives you like a blueprint and you kind of just have to know how the blueprint works. Yeah, to some extent. I mean, so here's an if statement. So it's if, what's your, um, 
ex your expression, then this else if expression, then else if else do something, and then end if. So it's um, I guess for me normally I'd think of C as if parenthesis you know x equals equals y parenthesis uh, yeah I'm thinking something like that for my Arduino world. You guys can't see that very well, which I think is based on C. So um, it's it's a variation, and as I will say, and I think I said overall with PL, uh, PLCs, it's a bit different. But once you know how to write a program, like once you learn one language, learning another one is easy. It's just a matter of figuring out the nuances of it. Like, oh, you know, this is an if statement here, but this is the if statement for Robot Studio. So now that you know that, it's like, okay, it's very simple for me to jump from one to the other to the other. Uh, and it's just a matter of keeping the expressions and everything um, consistent and correct from one to another. So. All right. Other questions for me? Quiet as all can be. All right. Let me... Uh... Free license gets me compared to the other license. Expired. Everything is expired. At the end of the year. That's. All right. Well, it's good to know that I can at least write somewhat something. Um, that's quick. I always have to remember how to do this every semester because I don't do it often enough. Now, if I go back to this. And let's go here. See if I can actually move a robot. Hey, I can. Well, that's good at least. Um. So here, let me go. Uh, at, uh, do all that. So, what I'm just gonna quick do is just kind of go ahead and grab, grab target view perfect. Uh, do, 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 do. Grab that one. That's fine. All right. So I can now just go like move, like move J, L P, back over here. E ten. Go move L. Rapid and apply. Beautiful. So now, in theory, if I go back to my simulation and I hit the play button, to go. Okay. Just realized that you guys can't see this. Uh, if I go to production window, PP domain. So now, if I hit play. that way there you can see we're moving back and forth and we're at a velocity of a thousand which is why we're moving so stinking fast there we go it's super slow Yeah, back. She last semester too. There we go. But anyway, so you can see how our robot's going to move around and things like that. So, um, but yeah, no. The first thing I'll make you guys do is we're going to end up just use purely using the teach pendant, and you're going to write all of your code that way. Um, 
and it will be a grand old time doing that and it will cause all sorts of fun issues but that's okay we will learn and be better for that